All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Light, and as uh, Pastor Peter just said, I am the worship director uh, here at Hope City. But today, I'm excited that I get the privilege to speak to you all and continue in our sermon series, Out of Step. But first, I can I just say thank you to Pastor Peter for just leading our church with such intentionality. I mean, nine months ago. Yeah, you can clap for that. So nine months ago, I walked into Peter's office, and there was something wrong. <laughs> there was this chaos that kind of broke out. There was this color-coded spreadsheet with these different colors and highlights and all these things. And I was thinking, like, Peter needs help. Like, what's going on with Pastor Peter? And what it was was it was the entire 2023 calendar, preaching calendar, sermon series calendar for Hope City for the entire year of 2023. And this was probably December that, that we had met, and he had told me, yeah, hey, on, um, on September 17th, you're going to be preaching. I was like, I got a lifetime away to worry about that. Like, sure, why not? But, man, that's Peter. Like, he's never flying by the seat of his pants. He leads with incredible intentionality here at Hope City. He, has, he, he doesn't take it lightly with the people that God has entrusted him with to pastor and shepherd. But according to the spreadsheet, y'all are stuck with me today. So let's strap in. I'm going to start off by asking you a question that you have probably been asked many times in your life. And that question is, what are you thankful for? I actually want you to write some things down. Write down three things. Pull out your sermon notes. Open the Hope City at, um, app um, and write down three things that you are thankful for. And those of you still looking at me and doing absolutely nothing and rule breakers, take a mental note of some things that you are thankful for because I promise we're going to circle back to this uh, later this morning. So if you haven't caught on yet today, we're going to be talking about gratitude and we're in the middle of our series, as I said, uh, titled Out of Step, where Pastor Peter has been talking about the importance of critical disciplines in our lives. And can I just say, I love discipline. Like, like a couple weeks ago, Paige and I, my wife Paige and I, we were, we were talking one Sunday night, and she asked me the question. She looks at me, and she goes, so do you like Friday better, or do you like Monday better? I was like, what, what do you mean? She's like, do you like Fridays, knowing that you're going to be going into the weekend, you can take some time off of work, relax, or do you like the grind of waking up and, and grinding out Mondays? So I thought about it, and I said, no, I mean, I, I definitely enjoy Fridays, especially as we've been able to kind of develop a, a culture with my job and, like, turning the phones off on the weekends and not being available and just be present with my family and relaxing and unplugging. But also, I got to tell you, there is something about Monday mornings. There is something about Sunday nights. I go, I make my overnight oats, I get my coffee lined up, I get everything lined up, and then Monday morning hits, 5.30 a.m., that alarm goes off, and I'm not a snooze guy. I get up right away, grab my phone, walk right out to the kitchen, because I'm ready to go, and I'm so excited to attack the day, to attack the week. And it, it is this routine that I love to get into. And the discipline of that routine, man, it feels good. I know, it feels, at 5.30, oh, gets me excited thinking about it right now. <laughs> it's something that I look forward to, but it's also something that's good for me. Because we've been saying throughout this series that discipline is the art of making consistent, positive choices that steer you towards your goals and dreams. And my morning discipline and routine is an aid in keeping me on the right track and starting my day out on a good one. But Peter asked me to talk about the discipline of gratitude. And so I started digging in, and at first I thought, you know, like, gratitude, that's easy. I'm a thankful person, right? And then um, two weeks ago I went into the office, and I looked at Peter, and I was like, this is the hardest sermon prep I have ever had to do in my life. And he looked at me puzzled, and he's like, why? And I realized as I was preparing for today that this is a discipline that honestly lacks consistency in my life, if I'm going to be straight up out the gun transparent with you. Because I'm going to say something super profound right here, right? Gratitude is defined as the state of being grateful. Duh, right? <laughs> we all know that. But really, I want to share some huge physical benefits that gratitude actually does for our bodies. According to um, a professor 
at UC Davis, Dr. Robert A. Emmons, um, who has studied the combination of science and gratitude, he has found just great benefits of thankful people. So thankful people, they exercise more, they're healthier, thankful people have less stress, they got more friends, they have better marriages, they get better sleep, and they live longer. Like, this all sounds great, right? Who, want, who wouldn't want any of this stuff? Who wouldn't want less stress or better relationships or better sleep? Like, we all want and desire these things, but yet we neglect to put in the work that comes first. I want to take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. It's going to be right on the screen um, behind me. And this is going to challenge our mindset on gratitude. And it says this. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. These are three things that God wants from us, and I believe that they can come from a place of practicing gratitude. To rejoice means to feel or express great joy, and thankful people, they find ways to rejoice. I remember when my, my first child was born, my daughter Kate, I remember, you know, we got to the hospital, and we had no clue what we were doing. We barely knew where to go. This is our first kid. This is our first rodeo. And I remember after she was born, you know, she, she comes out, and they, they take the baby, and they put him over onto the heat lamp. And I remember looking at her and, you know, touching her and touching her hand. And then, you know, she grabs my finger and I just, I was just in awe, like, I'm a dad. Like, oh, snap, this just got real. And I remember in that moment, I was so grateful that she was healthy. There was no complications. Paige was healthy. It was a healthy delivery. And I was, I was just able to experience such great joy. Pastor Stephen Furtick said, God's gifts alone are not able to give you joy. God's gifts alone can only bring you joy when they are joined with your gratitude. See, in that moment, God's gift of my little girl tied with my gratitude allowed me to experience great and incredible joy. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes we kind of forget about God. Sometimes when we're on those high and high moments and on the mountaintops, we can forget. Take a look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is, um, Moses is the author of Deuteronomy, and this is right after Moses had led God's people, the Israelites, out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage. He had already parted the Red Sea, and he's writing to the Israelites, and he's telling them about remembering God and all that he has done. And then he's talking about the promised land and what it's going to be like and, and how they need to continue to observe the Lord's command. So read this with me, starting out in verse 6. Moses writes, Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gr gushing out into the valleys and hills. A land with wheat, barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey. A land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Like Moses is telling the Israelites about the land. He's talking about the good stuff, man. Like what they're about to go into, what God has promised them. And he's telling them, you, you got to still remember where God brought you from. You got to remember Egypt still. Because then he says in verse 12, he says, Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, otherwise, if you forget, and then you go and you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold, all your wealth has multiplied, then, look at this, your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. If you don't turn your blessings into praise and thanksgiving, showing gratitude, those blessings will turn to pride in your heart. 
and then you're never going to be able to be filled with that joy. We got to remember where we came from. So even when we get into the promised land, or we're riding those highs of highs in life, and we're on the mountaintops, and things are going great, we still have to remember and have a heart of gratitude and rejoice in all of God's blessings. You know, a way that we get to rejoice in church is through corporate worship. What we just did a moment ago with, with, uh, with Aaron and the team, and we get to do that through singing because worship is an outward expression of our gratitude towards God for what he's done for us and what he's done in us. And that's what we get to do every single Sunday here at Hope City Church. And that was a good worship set. <laughs> that was awesome. I, I love being not the one leading worship oftentimes, but the one to be led and just to sit there and be filled and feel God's presence around you. Because that's what we try to do as a team at Hope City, and we talk about it all the time, is to create an environment where people can come and they can experience God. So thank you, Aaron, and the team, for doing that this morning. The second thing that we find from Paul is to pray continually. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. But what does praying continually actually look like? Praying continually is being in constant communication with God. But oftentimes, we kind of get into habits where we find ourselves really only praying maybe before a meal, or maybe it's even just like one meal, like at dinner time, we pray like, thank you for this food, amen? Or if we're having a bad day, or, or we're just having a bad season, and then we're crying out to God, we find ourselves really praying, you know, in those moments. Or when we're reading our Bible, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm reading my Bible right now, so... We're going to open up for, you know, in, in prayer. But really, God calls us to continual communication with him. This means that we turn to him in all moments of our day. We acknowledge him with gratitude and praise when we're driving in the car. We turn to him when we're having those frustrated moments in our life rather than picking up the phone to call our friend. We kind of go to God first. We admit when we've made mistakes, hey, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Praying continually is talking to God throughout your day. Sure, yes, about your problems, about your frustrations, yes. But not just about your problems. We need to have prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of thankfulness. The book of Psalms is a book that's compiled, it's largely written by David, and it's compiled of songs and prayers. And so I want to look at one in uh, Psalm 16. It says this, um, David wrote this, and he said, Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. I mean, David says right there, he says, you are my inheritance. You give me everything. I mean, just starting with little prayers. Start small. You know, you know who's great at this? is my mother-in-law, and she has no clue what I'm about to say right now. <laughs> but my mother-in-law, she is an incredible woman, incredible. And so she can, it can be July, hottest time of the year. It could be 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and she's going to go to Nathan Benerson and walk. And it's like 99 degrees out. And you know what? She'll start walking and power walking, and she'll go, thank you for my legs, Jesus. Thank you for the sun. Thank you for the heat. Thank you for this beautiful day. Me, I go there 95 degrees, and I'm like with like, like the kids, and it might be like 8 in the morning, and I'm like, God, it is hot. It is hot up in here. I don't want to be here. I want to go home where she is being so thankful and little prayers of thankfulness. But in all seriousness, it starts with the phrase, God, thank you for. Write that down. It starts with the phrase, God, thank you for, and fill in the blank of just the little things. It doesn't need to be something so profound and monumental. Like, God, thank you that I got a great night's sleep last night. God, thank you for my three healthy children that I get to wrestle and I get to love on every single day. And yes, they drive me crazy sometimes. But thank you for the gift of them. Thank you for the house that I have that I get to invite people over and cultivate relationships and build community. 
Or God, thank you for this beautiful place that we get to live in Florida. God, it has got some of the, the just the best sunsets, the best scene, the best scenery in the world. And God, your creation restores my soul. Thank you, Jesus. Start with prayers of thanksgiving for what God has given you. And the more we start to recognize and acknowledge the little blessings in our lives, the more we realize how many there really are. Because these prayers, they develop a heart of gratitude. When we start to say, God, thank you for, and we do that repeatedly, it becomes easier to do. The last thing that Paul writes to us in this verse is to give thanks in all circumstances. People who practice gratitude, they've developed the ability to give thanks in all circumstances. And no, that's not always easy because, let's face it, some of our situations, if we're being honest, they ain't pretty. It's messy. Life is hard. Life can be messy. But I also think that it can be easy to lose sight of gratitude in a world that praises comparison. Like people, people will often think, it, life would be so much easier if I just had another $30,000 to pay off debt. Or life would be so much better if I had this job that I've been working towards instead of the one that I currently have. Or life would be so much better if I was married. When you tell yourself this phrase, you're focused on what you don't have in comparison to others. And hear me say this, comparison kills gratitude. Write this down. Comparison kills gratitude. When we compare ourselves to other people, we find jealousy rather than being thankful for what God gave us. Listen, he's put you in the position that you're in today for a purpose, for a reason you got to stop looking elsewhere and give him thanks for that because grateful people, if we want to be grateful people, they give thanks in all circumstances. The 10th commandment even reminds us about comparison and desiring what someone else has. It says, thy shall not covet. Look at Exodus 20. It says, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. When we compare ourselves to other people, we find jealousy rather than being thankful for what God gave us because comparison kills gratitude. So I'm a full-time realtor, and Florida's a pretty popular place to live, in case any of you wanted to know that. I think there's something like a thousand people a day right now are moving to Florida. Isn't that crazy to think about? And you're probably like, well, they're all coming to Sarasota, Matt. Stop selling them houses. Because of all this traffic and we put these roundabouts in that supposedly makes sense on a computer model, but then we go to drive them and you put an 85-year-old behind the wheel and they just go up. And then the traffic backs up and now you're like, takes an hour to get anywhere. But in my career, we're almost taught to look and compare ourselves to what other people are doing in our field, in the market. Like, what new marketing techniques are they doing over here? Or if you produce, you know, content and videos, what, what videos are they doing over here? What's working? What's getting views? What's getting subscribers? Oh, did you see how many houses she sold last year? Or how do I be more like so-and-so? Because social media, they make it look like they got it all together. How do I be more like that? And we start thinking that what we're doing is not good enough when we compare ourselves to other people. We got to look at the good in our lives rather than the negative. And Paul writes to be thankful in all circumstances. And that's what people do when they have developed the discipline of gratitude. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. These are ways to express our gratitude to God. But oftentimes, we struggle to express gratitude in our lives. And you know what? Unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. Like if you were to throw somebody a party and give them a bunch of gifts, and they never said thank you, you would probably perceive them as maybe being a little ungrateful. If your spouse, let's say, you know, your spouse was, was out and you decided to clean the house. And I'm talking like, not just a quick vacuum. I'm talking like, 
going behind the toilet, cleaning that, the toilet, the baseboards, getting on a ladder, dusting the ceiling fans, moving the furniture, and like doing the stuff. And then they come home and they just walk by you. How does that make you feel? Like you just put all this energy and effort to help serve them and they say nothing. It probably communicates that they're ungrateful, even if they might be. Because unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. I mean, how many things do you go through in your day where you don't say, hey, thanks, sir. Hey, I appreciate that. How does God feel when we don't communicate it to him? Oh, well, Matt, you know, God knows my heart. He knows everything. Yes, but he still wants you to communicate it to him. He wants to hear you say it. Husbands, how many times this week have you told your wife you love her? we got to communicate with our words, guys. You may have heard it said before, an attitude of gratitude, right? It's a cute little phrase, kind of rhymes. I don't love this phrase. Because attitude is defined as a settled way of thinking and feeling about something or someone. It's in your head. But the habit and discipline of practicing gratitude is how you have an action around it. It's one thing to think about it, but it's another thing to put it into action. And in my previous example, when the spouse comes home and you clean the house, and it's one thing for them to come inside and think about being grateful, but it's another thing for them to look at you and say, hey, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. I see you. God wants us to express our gratitude to others and to him. We've talked about physical benefits of gratitude in 1 Thessalonians as challenge our mindset on gratitude. So how do we do it? How do we become more grateful? And I want to give you three quick steps on how you can flex the gratitude muscle and become better at showing and expressing your gratitude because you might actually be a grateful person. You're just really bad at expressing it or telling people or showing it. But we can all benefit from practicing gratitude a little bit more. Number one is you've got to recognize all things come from God. James 1.17 says this. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Who does not change like the shifting shadows? We've got to recognize that everything, every good and perfect gift comes from God. We've all heard of the story of David and Goliath, right? You know, David, shepherd boy, defeats this giant. You know, I mean, sports movies are made out of this all the time. But I think there's one aspect of the story that I don't think maybe you've heard of or, or maybe thought about. And that's the question is, Why is David even fighting Goliath in the first place? Why him? Why not Saul? Because King Saul, when he was anointed to be king of Israel, my man was ferocious. My man was a warrior. He conquered battles. Nobody wanted to mess with Saul. But Saul began to think that he was the one winning those battles. He was becoming prideful. And so when it came time to fight Goliath, he was scared. And when David stepped forward to fight him, King Saul said this. King Saul said, you are not able to go out against this Philistine, Goliath, and fight him. You're only a young man, and Goliath has been a warrior since he was a kid. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both a lion and the bear. Man, he sounds like a boss. Your servant has killed both a lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine Goliath will be like one of them, because he defies the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. See, David recognized that everything came from God and that this battle was already won and God was going to see the victory through. You know, if I'm being transparent with you, sometimes I can fall guilty in believing that anyone can go and do anything that they want. If they're disciplined enough, if they work hard enough, if they grind it out enough, they can go do whatever they want. I mean, society even, even tells us that if you're the one who has gone out and earned it, 
then you only need to be grateful for yourself. Because nobody else helped you with that. But the problem with this mindset is sometimes you begin to believe that it's you who is making all of these things happen, and it's not God. But if you recognize that everything is a gift from God, then you must be grateful to the Lord. And the next thing that we can do in practicing to increase our gratitude is to stop. Like, we need to slow down. I mean, our culture is so fast-paced, and we're so focused on, on what's next. Do I have any Florida Gator fans in here this morning? This side of the room only. All right, nothing over here. Okay, we'll talk over here. Um, Y'all had a pretty big win last night, a big upset over Tennessee. Um, I had to change my sermon around a little bit because I wasn't expecting that victory for you. Um, <laughs> Alex Hart texted me this morning saying, you got to change your sermon, bro. So, you're right. Well, anyway, congratulations to you all. But there is a, um, recently Netflix put out this documentary called Swamp Kings. And it goes through the head coach, uh, this is head coach Urban Meyer, um, and it goes through when Tim Tebow was there and when they won their 2006 and 2008 national championships. And I just thought it was fascinating to see all this behind-the-scenes footage that you've never seen before. And there was one scene in that, in, in one of the episodes, that really stuck out to me. I think it was after they won their second national championship. And <coughs> they, they're going off the field, the players in the locker room celebrating. And Urban Meyer says, the head coach, he says to them, he's, uh, he said, I just walked by them in the locker room, and they're celebrating, coaches are celebrating. He said, I walked into my office, and I started texting recruits for next season. Like, he was already on to next season. Here he had just spent nine months doing everything they could do to be the best of the best and be on the mountaintop. And here they were, champions. And he couldn't even appreciate it or stop to slow down to recognize it for more than a couple minutes after he had sacrificed everything that year. But aren't we all guilty of that sometimes? Like, I know I've been there. Like, I've had moments where I've had, like, a win or a success and experienced God's blessings, but then I neglect to slow down and give him the praise and gratitude because I'm so ready and we are so ready to move on to the next thing. Like, if you had a medical procedure coming up and you have all this anxiety around it, and then it's done and you find you have a clean bill of health, how much time do you spend being grateful after or you just move on to the next thing? Because we have so much anxiety and it consumes our thoughts leading up to it, right? But then when we find out, oh, we're good to go. Okay, all right, we're moving on. Do we even say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for helping me be healthy or helping this to come back positive? Like, we don't spend time and we live in a culture of doing and performing and accomplishing. Stopping to reflect, let's face it, it is not the norm. But when we stop and slow down to give gratitude, we get to experience the full joy of the blessings that God has given us. But we gotta stop, we gotta pause, we gotta put the phone off. The last thing that we need to do to grow in our gratitude is to put it into practice. You need to stop saying to yourself, I'll be grateful when. Matt, I'll be grateful when I have kids or when I get married. Or Matt, I'll be grateful when I get a promotion that I've been working for so hard. Or I'll be grateful when I get so many social media followers or I accomplish this goal or, or church. I'll be grateful when we finally get into the building that we've been renovating off, off of B Ridge and Macintosh. We gotta stop waiting around to express our gratitude and we've gotta do it. Like maybe there's a person that comes to mind that you need to reach out to and just express gratitude. They're not going to be mad when you send them a text. Remember when I asked you earlier, what are three things that you're thankful for? Like, I think we all naturally, like when Peter told me I was preaching on gratitude, like, yeah, that's easy. I'm a grateful person, right? But when I asked you that, to come up with three things on the spot, was that difficult for you other than like, you know, food, water, shelter? Was that difficult for you? Because to be honest, before this sermon, 
That would have been difficult for me if I'm just going to shoot straight with him. But it's not hard for the person who regularly practices the disciplines of gratitude because gratitude, and you can write this down, gratitude is a discipline. For some, it may not feel natural. I fall into that category. But you can get better at it. You can grow that muscle so you may make it become more natural. And you can do things like maybe setting up a reminder on your phone to ask you every day, hey, what's something you're grateful for? I think family rhythms, family habits are super important. Maybe you develop the habit within your family of, hey, once a week when we sit down for dinner, because I understand sometimes we don't all get to sit down at the same time and have a meal, but maybe once a week when we do get that opportunity, we're going to go around the table and we're going to ask everybody, what's one thing you were grateful for this past week? And I know some of us have young kids. I've got young kids, five, ages five and under, and they say interesting things. <laughs> But the point is, is to develop the habit and create that culture of being a more grateful person and practicing the habit of discipline. You could develop the habit of, when you go to read your Bible, before you open it, develop the habit of, God, thank you for this. And it doesn't, like I said earlier, it doesn't need to be something so profound. God, thank you for allowing me this space right now to read your word. You might be crazy enough, for those of you who are writers and journalers, you might be crazy enough to start a gratitude journal. But something that we're gonna do today is we're gonna implement our three action steps. We're gonna acknowledge that all things come from God. We're gonna pause and slow down and we're gonna put our gratitude into practice this morning. And we're going to do this this morning by, by receiving communion together. And during this next song, I have communion stations to my right and to my left up here at the front. And I want you, when the band starts to play, I want you to come and receive communion and bring it back to your seat. And I want you to think and remember all that God has done for you. Jesus said at the Last Supper, take this bread and he broke it. And he said, eat it in remembrance of me. And then he did the same thing with the cup of wine, representing the blood that was shed on the cross. You know, church, we have so much to be grateful for in our lives. And this morning, I want us to refocus our minds on him. Because God wants us to experience the full joy that comes from a heart of gratitude. Would you pray with me?